who is a data scientist out of Mumbai, India. And also, you might want to Google him. He's a prolific YouTuber as well. So let's go ahead and welcome him. Thank you so much for the introduction. Perfect. So I'll quickly start with what I aim to present today, which is how can you build a question and answering based chatbot using Google Palm 2's models along with uh, the question answer that you want to do is on a Neo4j database. Okay. So the talk is centered around how I've kind of integrated multiple technologies together and how I've built a solution that you can kind of ask questions to your database in natural language. So I'll quickly start. Uh, a bit about uh, a bit of introduction about me. So I happen to run a YouTube channel wherein I teach machine learning, data science, Python concepts. Uh, uh, so if at any point of time, I'll kind of share the QR at the end of the session as well. But here's the QR. You can scan it. You can kind of visit my channel. If you find the content relevant, you can subscribe to the channel as well. Uh, I I happen to be a Google developer expert in machine learning. I was awarded a 40 under 40 data scientist award and there are tons of other things that I've accomplished. Uh, given the time that I have, I'll quickly jump to the session. Uh, so in today's session, what we'll cover is what exactly is a large language model? Uh, how do you kind of create a prototype using Maker Suite, which is Google's offering of how you can uh, create a no code LLM based solution. Uh, once you have the prompt ready, how do you convert that into Python equivalent code and how you can integrate that into an application? Then finally, once I have the code ready, how do I kind of integrate that with a Python open source library called as Gradio and create a chatbot wherein you can ask questions to your data which resides in a Neo4j database using natural language. So this is what we'll cover today. I'll basically start with the basics of what the session is, which is what exactly is a large language model. So large language models or LLMs are advanced ML algorithms or models designed to understand and generate human like text. The reason why it's exploded so much in like a couple of years is the scale at which they've been trained and the corpus or the size of the models that are in contention, right? So every week there is a new leader in terms of which LLM is outperforming the other LLM. So there are different aspects of uh, why LLMs have kicked off and two major reasons of why they've kind of attained so much scale is the data on which that they are scaled or they're trained. And the second piece is the scale at which they are operating. So there are billions and billions of parameters in large language models, which are kind of trained during the training process. And while making an inference, the en entire input goes through that large language model and then gives out a prediction as well. Uh, so the reason why LLMs are doing so well, again, uh, apart from the scale and the size of the models, the reason why they're doing well is the amount of wide applications that you can cover using large language models. So you can use a large language model to basically classify. So if you have, say, uh, Amazon reviews, and if you want to classify them into positive or negative review, you can use an out-of-the-box large language model, and the LLM can kind of classify reviews into positive or negative. Uh, you can use LLMs for search. So uh, Basically, when you have to search like a huge document of sorts, then you have something called as rags, which are kind of gaining popularity. Again, rags combined with fine-tuned LLMs kind of give you really good powers wherein you can explore huge sets of documents and create solutions out of that. You can summarize text. So that is one other unique piece about LLMs as well. You can pass, uh, say, a huge corpus of document, and you can get a summary generated out of the entire document using an LLM. Uh, you can rewrite text. So I use uh, a lot of rewrite functions of LLMs to kind of craft my emails better, which is where I use LLMs again. Uh, uh, again, LLMs are used for generating text, which is where you can generate new text, you can generate poems, you can generate essays, you can generate questions from a piece of paragraph as well. You can cluster information together. You can uh, have clusters of different sets of information clubbed together. Then you can extract pieces of information that's relevant to what you are asking using large language models. So these are, these are the various use cases of LLMs. 
uh, a simple example of LLMs and how they work. Uh, so if I type in roses are red, and if I want the LLM to generate something after that, uh, it will say violets are blue and sugar is sweet. Okay. Uh, similarly, uh, LLMs are not only restricted for random text or say generating poems or essays. They are also used for generating code, which is where if I just type in this particular statement for uh, variable i equal to zero, and uh, if I want to auto complete this entire piece. Uh, then you have the next piece of text that's generated by the LLM as well. Uh, here are some other examples of LLMs. Uh, if I am not very clear of how a joke is a joke, then I can tell the LLM to give me what exactly is the funny part in the joke. So that is one thing that you can try out as well. The other idea is if you have an idea in mind and if you want to generate, uh, say, different project ideas, then you can use LLMs as well. So there are tons of other applications that kind of fall into this bucket of what LLMs can do. I just highlighted a couple of them. Uh, the advantage of using a large language model is you can kind of prototype uh, things faster. So if you have a project or a product in mind, and if you want to develop a solution quickly, rather than building a classifier from scratch, rather than building a solution from scratch, you can use an existing LLM, fine tune it for your use case, and then create a solution based on that. Uh, all of this started in 2017. So this is the very famous Transformer paper. So a lot of thank you goes to this particular paper for setting things apart in the LLM world. Uh, every LLM uh, kind of uses Transformer networks in some way or the other. So Transformers was first coined in 2017. It's an open source paper, paper by Google. Uh, it has two major sections. So you have the encoder block, which you see on the left side. And you, then you have the decoder block. So the encoder is where you pass in the input. Uh, if it's a mach machine translation task that you're trying to kind of achieve, if you're converting, say, French to English, then you will pass in input as French words or sentences. And correspondingly, the decoder will understand the nuances of what you have passed in through the encoder. And the decoder will give you the English equivalent responses. Okay. Uh, just to give you context in terms of how the overall, uh, say, self-attention mechanism works, here is a small animation. So self-attention kind of looks at every word. It kind of tries to figure out a self-attention score between the words that are there. Uh, this is kind of passed to the... So whatever is happening in the initial part of the animation is at the encoder section. Uh, once you have the encodings ready, all of those are passed to the decoding section. And then you have the decoded output as well. So here's a small animation of how things work uh, internally in the transformer network. And here is uh, the example that I've given here is basically a text summarization, ta uh, text uh, translation task. I'm converting from English to French, which is what you see here. So if the sentence is I arrived at the, and if I want to convert only the, these piece of four words into French, correspondingly, what happens is, in the encoding section, you have multiple layers of where encoding happens, and you are calculating attention scores. These attention scores are then passed to the decoding layer, where word by word, sequence by sequence, every word is generated one by word by word. Okay. Uh, one good thing about the encoder-decoder architecture and uh, say text generation is basically uh, your inputs can be uh, passed in parallelly and your output is generated sequentially word by word. In previous context, in terms of language models, we had RNNs and LSTMs. For RNNs and LSTMs, one of the major issues was while training, you pass in the input one at a time because you have to keep the time context uh, available as well, which is where the inputs were always sequential in nature, which has been overcome by the transformer models or the attention network that's there. Okay. Uh, how many of you have heard of GPT-3, GPT-4? So the GPT model that you see is a decoder-only model. Okay. So the network that I showed you previously, this one, this is think of this as the backbone network for all your uh, huge LLMs that are there. Uh, if I consider any GPT model, which is say GPT-3, GPT-4, etc., all of these are basically decoder-only model, they only have the decoder section in them. They don't have an encoder section in them. Okay. Uh, when you think of BERT, so Google's famous BERT model, uh, which was open source again, 
uh, is an encoder only model. When I say encoder only, what happens is you pass in the uh, list of say a, a sentence into the BERT. BERT will kind of create context aware emb embeddings, which is something that was missing previously. So when you have say word to vec as an embedding uh, mechanism, word to vec uh, at a word level would never understand context in the entire sentence. Uh, which has been overcome by, uh, say, context-aware embeddings, and one of the example is BERT. Uh, when you're doing a machine translation task or a, a language translation task, it's here that you have the entire, uh, say, network in place. You will have an encoder section that kind of converts your input sentence into context-aware embeddings. These context-aware embeddings are then passed through the decoder network which is then decoded and then you have the translation that's generated for that set of input sentence that you've passed in, okay? Is everyone with me? Any questions so far? Uh, we'll come to the questions at the end section as well. But here is where I wanted to uh, pause for a while. So what we've covered so far is uh, large language models. What are they? What are the various, uh, say, uh, what are the various networks that are in play? Now what I'll cover is graph databases. So graph databases are unique in nature. They are kind of uh, different as compared to MySQL databases as well as NoSQL databases. And I'll tell you why they are so unique and how you can use them to your advantage as well. So what basically is a graph, right? A graph is a set of discrete entities. Each of them have some relationships with the other entities, OK? We'll come to that. Uh, here you will have a lot of definitions in place. But I'll try to simplify it as we go along. So uh, when you think of the internet, when you think of cell phones, when you think of uh, laptops that are connected to the internet, every device that's connected to the internet, think of that as a node. And every connection that you have is basically a network connection between them. Okay? So uh, a simple graph can be the H2O molecule, uh, where you have two nodes, which are hydrogen uh, elements, and you have the oxygen element as well. So these are the two nodes that are there, and then you have connections between them. Uh, I don't know if, if you've had a chance of visiting, or if you've had a chance of traveling via the metro, but here is how you can represent the metro as a graph as well, where all your connections between nodes. So in our case, if I look at this particular image, uh, the, uh, every station or every stop can be a node. And the connections between them is where you have properties coming into picture. Okay. Now, when, when, uh, is there a reason why I'm kind of pushing for using a graph database as compared to a NoSQL or a MySQL database? Uh, well, the answer is initially in 1980s is where you had uh, a huge explosion of re relational databases. You have your MySQL databases where things were very structured. You have a row-wise approach. So you have rows and you have columns. You have a set schema decided. And they did really well for transactional data, uh, data which contains a lot of transactions like, uh, say, your online uh, buying and selling that happens or the other use cases that are there. Then uh, there were some limitations of MySQL databases, which is where NoSQL databases come in. Uh, they scale really well. But there's one issue with, uh, with them as well that they don't, they don't have inherent relationships uh, between the different entities which are there in the data, right? Which is where graph databases come in. Uh, graph databases started gaining a lot of popularity from 2013 onwards, which is something that you see in the example that I'll give you. So I'll kind of quickly try to cover the basics of graph theory. Uh, I won't give you like everything in one go, but I'll try to give you things that are important. So uh, here you see a graph which has two nodes and one connection. The nodes are in circle, and you have uh, the connection with them in the line. Uh, nodes become useful because they hold data in the form of properties. They also have labels, uh, which kind of help you uh, query the nodes really quickly. Uh, so if I have to understand in a graph database what exactly is a node, ask a simple question, what exactly is the noun in the example that I'm asking for, right? So if there is a database which is, say, an actor database or a movie database, uh, which actors play in this movie? How many movies did this director direct? And which users rated this particular movies more than four out of five, right? Every noun that you see will be a node in a graph database, OK? Similarly, you have relationships which are in form of edges. 
relationships become useful because they hold data. So in the data science context, today data is not a challenge, but identifying relationships and using that to generate insights is a bigger challenge, right? Which is where uh, graph databases come in really handy. Uh, relationships are basically words, verbs. So you have nouns which are nodes. Whatever relationships you want to model are basically verbs, okay? So here is where you have a node, you have labels. Uh, so you, you can have MacBook, which is fragile product. And then you can also have key values, key value pairs, which are properties in a node, which is something that you can use for iterating through a set of query really quickly. So here is where you have some relationships. And just to give you conceptual cal clarity in terms of how you can translate your MySQL database into a, a graph database. So your rows in a MySQL database become nodes in your graph database. Your joins basically become the relationships. Your table names become labels. And your columns become properties. So the key value pairs that you see in the graph database are nothing else but exact columns which become properties. Okay. So if you ever have to translate or convert a relational database into a graph database, this is something that you have to remember that this is how the entire conversion happens. Okay. Now uh, for MySQL, you have SQL, which is like a very renowned language. How many of you know SQL uh, basics, intermediate, advanced? I think everyone in the room would have at least heard of MySQL, right? So the SQL equivalent of uh, a Neo4j database graph uh, library is Cypher. So Cypher is basically a declarative language that allows you to identify patterns in your graph database. Okay. So just to give you a simple example, uh, if I have two nodes, you have customer product and customer has rated a particular product. How do you write the Cypher query, which is where you have, uh, you start off with nodes. Uh, in the round bracket and you have a hyphen starting uh, as a starting point, then you have uh, two uh, say uh, arrows here and then you also have a direction in the graph database. So you will have multiple set of nodes, you will have directions from starting node to the end node and then you will kind of add the relationship type in the node. So if I have to match nodes from customer who have rated a particular product then the query would be something like this. Match C customer which rate uh, or who have rated a particular product and then I want to return the customer name which is like a property of that particular node, product name or P dot name as product and the total stars that that particular user has given to that particular product. Okay. If this idea is clear, I'll quickly move on to the next piece in terms of what I've done with this entire activity. <coughs> Sorry. So here is the Neo4j uh, database uh, stack. So you have different products here. The one that I'm using for this particular use case is the Neo4j Aura DB. It's a free to use service. You can use a uh, enterprise edition as well. But whatever graphs you want to create, you can create it using an Aura DB instance. If you have a data science task in mind, if you want to create a classification algorithm or a regression based solution, then you can use Neo4j's Aura DS as compared to Aura DB. Okay. Now here is how the entire Aura DS screen looks like. And if I type in the command match n return n, so the command that you see on the top match n return n is the SQL equivalent of select star from the table name. Okay. So when I'm given a table on, in my SQL, the first command that I write is select star from table name. If I want to visualize how the graph looks like, I type in match n, return n, which returns all the nodes and relationships that are part of that particular database. Okay. I am using a default data set in the, uh, the Neo4j Aura DS instance, which is the movies data set. It contains nodes like the movie node. So here, I think everyone's seen the movie, the matrix. So the movie matrix is one node, which is highlighted in purple. Then you have people node or person node, which is basically uh, how people have contributed to that particular movie. So a, a person could have acted into the movie or a person would have directed the movie or produced the movie. All of these relationships are captured in this particular graph database. Okay. Every node has a property. 
So a property like release is the release year. You have tagline for that particular movie. You have the title of the movie. Similarly, for the person node, you have the date of birth or year of birth, as well as the name of that particular person that's there. Okay. Now, I've given you an introduction of large language models. I've given you an introduction of uh, the graph databases. Now, I'll try to combine the two and create a solution beyond this. So here is where Makersuite comes in. So Makersuite is basically Google's way of showing you how you can generate a large language model based solution using very few lines of code. So what I do is I enter a prompt. Okay. I have created a graph database that's existing in say uh, Neo4j. Now I want to connect it using Python. I want to ask questions to it in natural language, which is where I want someone to convert my cipher query into, I want my natural language to be converted into cipher query, which then runs on the Neo4j instance and then gives me a result and I'm able to chat with my data in natural language. Okay. So the starting part of the query is where I define you are an expert in converting English to cipher language. Uh, the graph has the following uh, properties. I've listed out the different nodes which are there. Every node will have a set of properties, which is what I've highlighted. The graph has relationship types, which is what I've highlighted. And all relationships acted in, directed, follows, etc. start from the person node to the movie node. Okay. So these are some of the basics that I've already highlighted. Then the next thing that I've done is I've given some few short examples of how someone can convert, say, English language to cipher code. Okay. So here are three examples that I've given how you can type in questions in English and what is the corresponding cipher query that I want to generate based on the large language model. Okay. Once I've done that, I press on run and I pass an input just to test the output. So the question that I ask is name the director of the movie, the matrix reloaded. And here is the response that maker suite gives me. Okay. So, the potential of maker suite is such that you can create an entire prompt based solution for your use case without having to write any single line of code. What I've done so far is I've smartly created a prompt that converts my natural language English into a cipher query, which I can then run through a driver on the Neo4j database, extract the result and return the result and then integrate everything into a chatbot, which is what I'll demonstrate right now. So there is an option. So you have something called as get code. So if I go back uh, on the left hand side, top left hand side, you would see something called as get code. When you press on that, uh, you will have a screen like this, wherein you can export your uh, say uh, input into a Python file or JavaScript or JSON, anything that you are comfortable with. Uh, once you have the entire prompt and the entire code, uh, say, exported in form of Python, what I've done is I've created a function that calls, that's basically get underscore answer, which is basically taking the prompt. Uh, it, take, it expects an input, which is natural language, and it will give out a cipher query for me. Here, this piece of function is basically helping me to connect to a Neo4j database using Python. So this is the uh, Python driver code. And finally, here is uh, the piece of code which helps me uh, connect to the Python, uh, the Neo4j instance that is there. So all of this entire piece is Python. And finally, I'm using Gradio, uh, the amazing open source library wherein you can create uh, web interfaces very quickly with say at least, say at least in a couple of lines of code. So with this, what I'll show you is how the entire screen looks like. Uh, if I pass in the input as who directed the movie matrix, the out output is Lana Wachowski and Lily Wachowski. The good part or the amazing part of the entire solution, if you visualize is I have a Neo4j database some, somewhere that exists. If I have a lot of business users that ask questions to me, in terms of getting the data for me and getting the exact answers. What I've done is I've streamlined the entire process for them, wherein they can ask questions to a Neo4j database in natural language. The Google Maker Suite solution converts my code into, uh, say, 
uh, converts my natural language input into a Neo4j Cypher query. This Cypher query is then run using a Python driver on the Neo4j database. I get a result back. I publish that result into this particular chatbot interface that I've created. So this is the solution that I've created using LLMs, a uh, Neo4j database, and entirely in Python. Okay. Then if I go forward and if I ask the next question, name the actors in the movie The Matrix. This is the output it gives me. So it kind of goes through all the actor nodes that are present in, uh, which are connected to the Matrix movie, and it gives out the result to me in natural language again. So if you have use cases wherein you have data in a Neo4j database, what you can do is you can effectively create a question answering based system where none of your data goes to any server. If you are really protective about data privacy as well, then you can try it out with, say, open source models as well. But if you are OK to send at least a prompt to the server and then get the response back, which is where Google's Maker Suite would come into picture. And uh, yeah, I mean, if I ask one more question based on the uh, data that resides in the Neo4j database, name the producer of When Harry Met Sally, uh, it gives me an answer. So based on your data that's available in the Neo4j database, you can create a question answering based system that can help business users ask questions in pure natural language. Okay. Uh, so this is something that I have. Uh, again, given that this was based on attention, the entire LLM revolution is based on attention. Thank you everyone for your attention. If there is, if you want to learn, keep learning about LLMs and data science ML. Uh, you can click on the QR and uh, go through go through my YouTube channel as well. But uh, yeah, this is all that I have for today's session. Thank you so much. Any questions? Hi. Hi. Uh, so I just wanted to know. Um, oh, sure. So my name is Josefa Punawala, and I'm the head of product uh, working with predictive data. So our solution is a big data solution. OK, so and we are using Elasticsearch. And we have like a million, millions of records that we have to process every time. So I just wanted to know the performance difference between Elastic search and Neo database in terms of searching search uh, capabilities. So uh, I have not used Elastic before, which is where I can't comment in terms of how much scale up you can uh, see. But if you have a relational database and a Neo4j database, and if you've modeled the entire graph quickly, and if you have say a million records, you can see a thousand to a ten thousand time improvement in your query speed as compared to your normal SQL database. The reason why Neo4j databases scale really well is because of the structure in terms of how they've been created. Traversing a graph is basically a O of 1 or, of, or O of n operation, wherein you have a MySQL database when you have multiple joins in place. You will have the entire, say, uh, the overall time complexity would increase, which is where scaling is very simple as compared to uh, a MySQL database. So I've not used Elastic before, which is where I can't comment on the performance change. But overall, graphs or Neo4j in general is very good at scaling when you keep increasing the number of nodes. OK. And in between Neo4j and MongoDB, because they are similar, sort of similar. Uh, Mongo is still MySQL if I if Oh, I no, it's uh, no SQL. No SQL, yeah, yes. yeah. So, Again, for NoSQL, you cannot model relationships, which Correct. is where relationships come in handy here. Okay. So if I have a lot of queries where I have to define relationships between two sets of, uh, say, uh, nodes or two sets of entities, I would choose graphs over NoSQL databases. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Welcome. Done? Perfect. Cool. Thank you so much.